Chasing Leviathan is a podcast about pursuing truth, one big question at a time through the discipline of listening. Truth is too big to tame. But if we pay close attention, we might get the chance to glimpse something truly magnificent. So please join me in this pursuit, one week at a time. Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm your host, PJ Weary. I'm here with Dr. Halvard Lillehammer. He is currently professor in the S School of Social Sciences, History and Philosophy at Birkbeck. Um, Dr. Lillehammer, really grateful to have you on today. Uh, really excited to talk about the trolley problem that the uh, volume is coming me. out. Yeah. And uh, so we're talking about the trolley problem um, and you edited this volume that has 12 original essays. Uh, Tell me a little bit about how you kind of came to be part of this book. That's a, it's a long story. I can try and make it as short as possible. So um, I've been thinking about some of these topics for a long time. I'm interested in thought experiments and how we think about uh, morality. I'm interested in the gap between how sometimes we're very sure about how we come to certain moral conclusions, but when we try to explain why we come to those conclusions or we come across evidence as to why we came to think the things we thought, the story is not always what we thought it was and we're perhaps not very good at it. And then the question is what to make of that in practice. And I think the, the literature on the trolley problem that's developed over the last uh, half century or so in some sense includes contributions to thinking about all of those things. So when the opportunity came along to do this project, I thought this was a, in principle an interesting idea, but there's a particularly good reason to do this project, which is that um, there's like a, a several strands of thinking about the trolley problem have developed over the last uh, half century, but they've developed in parallel. Uh, and this project gave, gave us an opportunity to to bring these strands together, so both the traditional moral theorists, the people who work on the psychology of moral thinking, and people who think about the application of thought experiments to, to real life issues. So that's like a unique uh, selling point or, or, or attraction to this particular project. And also it's a very good time to do it because the, some of the people who have been the main drivers of this literature are, are still active, and some of them are contributing to the volume. Uh, sadly, the, the people who initiated or created or invented the problem are no longer with us, um, but uh, some of the main contributors are. So in that sense, it was particularly exciting for me to be able to work with these people, and I've, and I've enjoyed doing so. That's great. Uh, and I definitely want to come back to what those parallel strands are. That's really fascinating to me. Um, but And I'm, I'm sure a lot of our audience is familiar with it. But do you mind just explaining what the trolley problem is? Well, that's a that itself is a problem. But yes, so some <laughs> people think the trolley problem is just like an, a thought experiment of a, of a case. Um, perhaps the first instance of it is a, is a driver who's who's on a train heading towards five people on a track, and the train can't be stopped, and then they have one option only, which is to switch to another track where there's another person, and the consequences are specified stipulated either five people will die or one person will die so sometimes colloquially people think that that's the trolley problem but that's not the trolley problem uh, most people who are asked about this uh, and there's quite a lot of evidence that this is quite uh, almost universal will think that perhaps it's okay that to switch in that case the problem arises because there are other cases that are structurally identical in terms of their consequences where people come to the opposite conclusion uh, so initially, the, the example uh, that was used, for example, by uh, Philip Afoot, who was the first person to introduce this example, was that of a judge who was in a position whereby uh, punishing an innocent person uh, could save a number of lives. Uh, and why was that different from what the driver did in the, in the trolley case? And then, a um, little less than a de decade later, Judith Jarvis Thompson introduced uh, the case of a doctor who could kill one patient and distribute their organs to five people. 
And then a decade later after that, she came up with a, 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 another example uh, of, uh, of, the, of the same um, structural problem. Uh, and the, the narrowest definition of the trolley problem that can be thought of as defining the problem is, is to have these two cases where the consequences are the same. Uh, you either have five people die or one person dies. Uh, but in some cases, people think it's okay to do so, say the driver case, but in the case of the doctor or the judge, it's not okay. And I think that's a, an, as nice a definition of the trolley problem, narrowly understood as you can have. Mm. But again, that's not the only way people think of the trolley problem. Some people go even more abstract. So one of the main contributors to this literature in recent decades, Frances Cam, she defines it much more generically as a question that arises for people who think that you should not always produce the best outcome. And then you have to try to find a way to explain why sometimes it's okay and sometimes it's not okay to cause harm for the greater good. And that in some sense is what the trolley problem is really about. And then finally, there are those who label the trolley problem almost any kind of use of an abstract thought experiment that abstracts away from reality, is very schematic, normally includes a fixed set of what the consequences are, and then uses that to theorize in some way. Um, so there are, there's a very narrow way of thinking about it, it's a very, uh, very uh, general way of thinking about it. But I think uh, being true to history, it's about these two cases. Uh, one case at least involves a trolley. Uh, these days they both involve a trolley, uh, the variations on, the, on trolleys, and, and that I think is the best way to understand what the trolley problem is. Um, yeah, I love that. And I, I, when I went through my ethics course and in, in my master's, uh, we talked about it and we talked about it as a pedagogical tool where you basically kept adding different variables until you made people uncomfortable. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, and it is odd. It's, it's weird to see how people react to different particulars and everyone will say that they're very cohesive in their moral framework. And then you just keep adding stuff until eventually you find something and they're like, yeah, but I don't know why, you know, or, or no, I wouldn't do that, but I don't know why. Um, you know, I, I think one of the more common ones is the idea of um, taking a, a larger man instead of switching, you know, five from five to one, taking a larger man and pushing him in front of the train to stop the train. And uh, like, well, indeed, in, indeed. So, so these days, probably. I would have thought the majority of, of cases when the trolley problem is discussed in the philosophical literature involves two cases involving trolleys. One is the case of a, of a bystander who can flip a switch yes, uh, so that the train that is heading towards five can then go towards one person. And the vast majority of people who are normally asked whether that's permissible will say it's permissible or, or okay or some other positive work. And then that case is contrasted with what's known as the footbridge, which is the one that you talked about, where some large person is on a, on a footbridge over the, over the tracks, the train is heading towards them. Uh, if you push that large person onto the track, the, it'll stop the train but kill the large person. And most people who are asked say that you can't do that. And then the question is, what's the difference? And perhaps that's now the, I would have think that's the dominant way of defining the trolley problem in terms of cases. Yes, and I, and I've heard you know variations with the like, are, what if you're related to the one person, or what if you you know you have a stranger, like five strangers, one person you know, all that. Which, anyways, I, I don't want to get uh, I, obviously like this is something that you've studied. It, it's always been a fascinating, um, and I think that's why it keeps coming up a fascinating discussion. I love that you have gone to that more abstract side of it because it becomes clear. That's what that's what's important, right? That uh, you know, this is just a very clearly visualized uh, example um, that we can use uh, as a thought experiment. Versus, um, there's immediately when you talk about the judge and the innocent man, the doctor and the organ donor, you get um, the emotions uh, flare up a lot faster than with the trolley problem. If that makes sense. Yes. Yes. I mean, I remember when I was first introduced to this, and it's so, so long ago, I can't really remember it. I felt very uncomfortable, um, and I had some of the reactions that you just described. So one is the, the sort of sense of dumbfounding when you, when you start being drawn into this thing, 
Sooner or later, you realize you're, you're losing your bearings. But even before that, a sense of reluctance even to be drawn into it in the first place. Like it was some kind of trick question or, or you know, why do I have to think about this? Uh, which is itself, I think, an, int an interesting feature of the thing because on the one hand, it has this uncomfortable feel when you take it seriously. But on the other hand, it has this capacity to get vast numbers of people involved in thinking about this issue and then take some kind of hypothetical view about what should happen in these circumstances. Um, so from being like, like a young and arrogant, maybe adolescent who thought this was all just <laughs> a trick, I've become much more, I've come to take it much more seriously the fact that people allow themselves to be, or are, are accept the invitation to think about this in, in so many different ways. I love, um, you know, even as you uh, talk about this, the introduction that you wrote for this uh, was eye-opening for me because I love to come to these sorts of things and I feel like there's a certain blindness when uh, the history is hidden. And I don't know if it was intentionally hidden. I don't, you know, I think they were just using it as a thought experiment. But the fact that it originally arose in the uh, abortion debate in the UK you mind speaking to that a little bit, just giving us that kind of that brief history of how this arose and how it was used uh, as it first started? Yeah, so the, the first occurrence in the, in the academic literature that is cited, of course, you never know, there might be versions earlier on that haven't, haven't survived. But the one that everybody mentions is a paper by Philip Afoot in 1967 called The Problem of Abortion and the Doctrine of Double Effect. And 1967 was the year when abortion was made legal in the UK. And the paper wasn't, wasn't about trolleys and it wasn't about the trolley problem. It was about various ways in which it might be permissible to kill another human being uh, when the aim is good. And part of the things that uh, Foot had in her target was this very famous and, and very influential historical doctrine called the Doctrine of Double Effect, which says that it's sometimes permissible to cause a death as a side effect when you're not intending it either as an end or as a means to your end. And she used various thought experiments to undermine this view and try to replace it with another view. And in the course of doing so, she mentioned a lots of hypothetical cases uh, as, a, as what she described a bit of light relief. Uh, and one of these pieces of light relief was this, the case of the driver, which was then compared to the case of the judge. Uh, and that was basically it as far as Foote was concerned. But it was then, uh, nearly a decade later, that Judith Jarvis Thompson picked up on this and sharpened up and defined the problem as we now know it as what she called a nasty, lovely, or a lovely, nasty, can't remember which way it is, difficulty, which a moral theorist needs to resolve. And then the, we've kind of moved one step up a, a bit and, and we're trying to, to think about a way of coming up with consistent principles that allow us to capture all the variations of these cases. And to say that an industry grew out of this is not an exaggeration. There were, was a long period when people developed various um, solutions to this problem. I mean, Thompson herself developed at least three different solutions to it during the course of her career. Um, and for many years, that was really what role the trolley problem played. But eventually, for various reasons, people found that they could use this um, problem to think about other things too, not just normatively or ethically, but also descriptively. Because you can think about the trolley problem in two different ways. You can think, okay, here we have this issue. In some cases, people think it's okay to, to let one person die or kill one person to save five. In some case, in another case, it isn't. Now, one, one thing you might ask is, and what's the explanation for why it's right to do one thing rather than another? That's the normative question. But another question is, what is it that explains that people come to these judgments? And so a descriptive project or a science developed to try and explain why that was. And some of the most f fertile and, and, and challenging intellectually work that's been done on this issue in the last couple of decades has been to try to negotiate how we should understand questions about how people actually come to make these judgments and what that tells us about how they should or vice versa. Yeah, uh, I, that moral, and I, I, as you talk about the descriptive side, I think you're talking about that strand of moral psychology, right? Um, and so I think that's a perfect lead in. You, you did talk about the parallel strands before. So you have the, the moral theorists, the moral 
psychologists. And then you mentioned uh, applied thought experience, experiments as kind of a third strand. Can you talk us through those three strands? Yeah, so if you go back to foot, the question was about the problem of abortion. And so the question was, in what circumstances uh, might it be permissible to, to kill a fetus uh, in, in the pursuit of some good, which is here the, the, the mother's health or, or well-being, or to, to save her life? Uh, so there's a very clear application. But the other applications that have been talked about um, have been, for example, involving um, the ethics of, of killing in, in aggressive conflicts. Uh, so some of the contributors to this literature have been interested in the ethics of war. Some of the examples that are used are about diverting rockets and various types of things like that. You might think about it now in terms of uh, uh, the high technology that goes into various uh, uh, weapons of war, such as drones. And in more civil cases, uh, there is now a, a literature and, of course, a, a legal and political situation around the use of automation in in vehicles like cars. So the question is to what extent can or should we use these kinds of thought experiments to illuminate uh, how to think about these particular practical issues. And that's a third strand that, that has developed in some sense in parallel to these strands, uh, in some sense uh, in, in interaction with them. Some of the main contributors, Cam, Thompson and so on, have contributed to both strands. Uh, can you talk, you, you mentioned the, for the particular fertility of the moral psychology strand. Can you talk a little bit more about what you've seen and appreciated out of that strand? Well, so this is something that um, really goes sort of straight to the heart, really, of my interest in, in philosophy from when I was very young. One of the things that drove me into philosophy was this perceived gap in many cases between having a strong opinion and being able to explain it, justify it, or uh, have a con confidence in it when you realize how it came to be. Uh, so the, you know, the, the standard accusation is you only say that because, and then some story comes along. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that story is uncomfortable and, and, and not true, and sometimes it's uncomfortable and true. <laughs> so, so some of the, the discussions about not just trolley problems, but other thought experiments, that have investigated people's, uh, you know, psychological, the psychological causes thereof, and perhaps even the, the neuroscience thereof, sometimes create a kind of dumbfounding effect. Right. And so the question is, what do we make of this? And I think the, there's a question about whether, I say, at which end, which end do you start? You can start at the descriptive end and talk about how people come to make certain judgments. And then ask yourself, what do we learn from that in itself about what we should do? Or you can start at the other end, which is how I've normally thought about it traditionally, although that's just my view. You have your normative or your moral convictions, and then you think that you should update them in light of relevant empirical information. And you learn some empirical information about how you've come to make these judgments. Uh, or evidence, because evidence is usually contested in some way. And then you ask yourself, what am I going to make of this? Uh, now that I have learned about the, the causes of my, my convictions or the fact that the, the explanation I came up with perhaps doesn't have much to do with uh, what I would say in another case and so on and so forth. And then you, yeah, you, tr you have to feed this into your process of moral reflection in some way. Um, and I think that, that it's one of the most fascinating aspects of this literature from my point of view. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, you talk about the dumbfoundedness. What do you find interesting about the reluctance that people have to even delve into this question? Do you find anything particularly interesting about that? Uh, well, so I think there's a general uncomfortableness about being confronted with the fact that we are, as it were, in some sense, not strangers to ourselves, but, you know, the the psychology behind how we react to the world is, is in many ways opaque to us. Mm. And that you don't have to be a neuroscientist to think that. It's just even before you, you start thinking about this scientifically, it's quite clear that often that is the case. History, sociology, family relationships, uh, beliefs you've inherited, all these sorts of things are, are a part of that, uh, about, about that thing. So, so that's uh, um, something one just needs to take on board, I think, 
Um, from my point of view, I think the the question is whether people have been reluctant in philosophy to take this seriously, partly for what you might think of as sort of institutional or sociological reasons about a discipline that thinks of itself as having a certain integrity. People often talk about armchair philosophy or philosophers, the philosophy seminar room or, or things like that. Or they talk about a priorism. I guess all, all these labels are labels for um, a history and a tradition of thinking about certain moral problems, theoretical problems, in isolation from empirical facts that surround them. Uh, uh, and there are structural incentives in institutions to be reluctant to do those things because you have to learn lots of new things. Uh, and there's also a sense of confidence among some people. I mean, some people just think that just by sitting and thinking very hard about these issues, like various very variations on the trolley case, you can just work out A, what to say about them, and B, what the principle is. And all this empirical stuff about you know, how our minds work and our history is, is kind of irrelevant. Um, it's, it, you just turn around and say, well, well, thank you for telling me how we got there, but how we got there is not so important as where we should go. And I've worked that out from the armchair. I think that's part of the, of the reason for the reluctance, as well as just this sense of, of discomfort. Have you ever taught this, or even just in sharing with other people, what are some of the, your favorite reactions you've ever had teaching or sharing the trolley problem with people? Um, I guess the, the, most, the thing that most strikes me is, is it, are, are, is that there's always a minority of people who refuse to engage. Hmm. So when I, I used to, in, in the, I don't do this nowadays, but I used to do this way, way back when there was much less empirical evidence, systematic evidence on these things. I used to do surveys of my students. Hmm. And I used to have three options, which was yes, no, or permissible, impermissible, and then boggle, which is like, reject the question. <laughs> And there, there, always has, there always has been a group of people who reject the question. And that's something that is, that is fascinating to me. Uh, there's also always a minority that goes against what is normally considered to be, as it were, the right or accepted answer. Um, and I've always been interested to find out, and I don't know enough about that really, uh, why it is that you get those those answers and i have some ideas in some cases but, but yeah, not yeah. Always. oh i i mean even as i think about my class there's always those people who uh insist on like the rigor and the logic of it and so like for instance like most people are okay with the switch but not with the pushing the person on the footbridge and then there's always like that small minority of people who are like nope if we're okay with the lever, we are okay with pushing the person on the bridge. And I'm like, I, we don't have to jump so quickly, right? Like, it's like there's, but yeah, I, I understand. Um, uh, do, you, do you think that there are some principles that uh, are just harder to articulate that are, that are coming from the, those kind of intuitions um, that we, we find empirically? You know, as you talk about like how we get there. Well, I mean, I, the the person you described who who basically wants to be consistent between the two cases has a kind of strongly utilitarian mindset. At least that's what convinced themselves of, of. And there are always such people. There are also I also have students who are very much in the opposite side, but not very not as often. I once had a discussion with someone who would not uh, act to save the greatest number. In any case whatsoever, because mm. the person in question believed that uh, um, that would be be complicit, or uh, you make yourself complicit in, or you'd be actually actively killing another person, or some such thing, and that should very never, uh, never deontological, happen. right? Like uh, very, 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 yeah. very deontological. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But between that, I think I don't have a sort of systematic sense of what from the P students I speak to about what what this what is really going on, except I mean, two things. One, there is muddle. And the other, there are some of those principles which we, we have known from a long time ago, 
which do seem to play a large part in people's thinking at some level, because they are articulated in perhaps in, in our common culture. So the difference between killing and letting die or acting in a mission or being active or passive, that's clearly mm -hmm. something that is very common that comes up into these discussions. The, the considerations I mentioned earlier about the doctrine of double effect, so intention and foresight, perhaps less often in my experience with my students. There's also the issue about whether you're using someone as a means to an end, or purely as a means to an end, as Kant would say. Um, I think that comes up. Uh, and then a lot of the time, uh, people have a worry about who is involved and who is not involved in the scenario. Mm. And those are the sort of my uh, perfectly uh, informative, uh, sorry, in informal experiences of the things that come through. Of course, you know this is studied by people. Um, systematically now across cultures and in, in the in the no, in the book there is a chapter which does a study of probably all the systematic cross-cultural comparisons that have been made in recent years including one that came out a couple of years ago which compares people across 40 different countries so you know that's where you should go for the for the for the answer to your question not not from my personal experiences from the classroom <laughs> I, I do have to ask, and obviously we want people to buy the book and get that in depth, but what was the most surprising thing for you reading that chapter in the book about the cross-cultural, the, the 40 or uh, so studies across countries? I don't think there was that much surprising. Hmm. Um, perhaps, perhaps the people who should pay attention are the ones who would say, you can't generalize from what people say in, I don't know, California or London about the trolley cases because you just talk to a bunch of people where you are. I mean, it looks like at least in the two core cases we mentioned earlier, the bystander case and the footbridge case, there's quite a lot of evidence that people who are allowing themselves to be drawn into these questions and they are usually probably from a maybe more highly educated demographic. I mean, there may be some self-selection. I mean, I'm not saying that we're demographically completely uh, representative, but there does seem to be quite a lot of evidence that, that people go a certain way in these cases. So that's one interesting thing about it. But the picture is mixed uh, mm. when, it com when it comes to other cases and, and uh, and that's also unsurprising, I think. But I think we should be aware of one important thing when it comes to these, these studies and what they're studies of, which is they are studies of people considering a thought experiment. They're not studies of people's behavior. Right, right. I mean, I, I, it did occur to me, even as you're talking about, like, do I know the person, not know the person? I think those are often more intellectually honest questions. When you think about, like, that's someone who's, imaginatively putting themselves in that <laughs> in that place because if my son is the one person that's a very different uh and i whether that's right or wrong it's definitely in the moment of making that decision yeah well i think you're bringing up something very important there about what the problem now has come to be hmm. because the problem has come to be more and more abstractly defined so that the persons in question are supposed to be, as it were, any arbitrary person, any arbitrary innocent person. Now, of course, the arbitrary person doesn't exist. Right, right. And all else is never equal. So whatever we're talking about, we're not talking about the real world. And mm. if we're starting with a problem in the real world, such as one that involves one's child or one's colleague or someone one that knows and doesn't know, you're starting in another place. So the question really is, what, if anything, can we learn about that from thinking about these abstract cases. And I think clearly there's a lot of controversy about that, but one should be careful to think that you can just go on the shelf and pick a trolley case <laughs> and apply it <laughs> to these uh, real world cases. I think that's, but there, I, I fear there has sometimes been a tendency pedagogically to kind of do that. It's tempting, it can be fun <laughs> as it were, but I think one should be very careful. Uh, like one should be careful with any kind of mo modeling, because in some sense, this is a kind of modeling, right? Mm. A model is not necessarily supposed to be predictive of how things are. It's a, it's a thinking tool that you use to identify certain features in the real situation, so you can think more clearly about the real situation.
And what you then go on to do about that is a very different question. Mm. No, and that's good. And, and I, it, it's, it's a very careful sort of um, caution that I think characterizes the best of philosophical thinking. So I appreciate you, you bring that into the discussion because it is, it, uh, it's easy to elaborate on. It's, a, it's an easy um, philosophical student's late night at a coffee shop or somewhere else to just like just keep adding on to it and feel like they have these answers uh i'm reminded i had we were getting kind of glib in our ethics class we were working through i don't know if it was the trolley problem uh per se um and uh another student who'd become a good friend of mine about halfway through the class, we were talking about more and more terrible things, right? But it was abstract, so <laughs> no one cared. And then um, something someone said related directly to uh, this other student's life experience, which involved uh, he and his wife had a disagreement about whether to do an invasive procedure to check on a health concern for her while they had a baby. And uh, he said they should, and she said, that they should not and uh obviously she had uh final autonomy over her body and she was fine um and he could have harmed his child right and he started crying in the middle of class and it was amazing how i like the real realization i think this is that moral psychology part you're talking about is how we'd become so glib and hadn't thought through the consequences of what we were saying and then all of a sudden the the enormity of uh, maybe even the, you know, if I didn't say the sanctity of the lives we were talking about or the, the experiences we were just kind of jettisoning, jettisoning out into the void uh, became very clear. And I, that was, that to this day is still something that struck with me is to, to sit with the gravity of what I'm saying, even as, as I go through it. Um, I don't yeah, know if I that- I think that's one of the, it's one of the most challenging thing to teach actually ethics in general is to be to be respectful towards your audience towards the topic that you're ultimately aiming at which is to live well mm. and also to the material you're using to think about that and i think it's easy to transgress boundaries not just because you're lazy or glib but also actually because of methodological convictions so of course there are some people who are very ambitious on behalf of what moral theory can deliver in certain very simple ways, for whom it will be a matter of having the courage of their convictions. If asked the question, should you do so and so in this real case, we will maybe have to say yes or no, because that's what they really believe. Um, so it, I think it does depend really on, on some deep philosophical questions about what moral theory is about, what it can deliver, and what we should expect of it when we, when we apply it to real cases. I. Um... Now, this is a little bit of a, a callback to a, what we had discussed previously, but uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, positive duty versus negative duty in terms of uh, the trolley problem, how it was first kind of discussed? I think that's uh, Philippa foot, but I could, be, I, be, I could be wrong about that. Yes, so, so um, what's now the, one of the canonical parts of the trolley problem came out of a criticism of Philip Foote's work. Because in this famous paper in 1967, where she uh, criticized the doctrine of double effect, she proposed an alternative view, um, which uh, on, on some readings would resolve the trolley problem in some of its instances, which was to distinguish between positive duties you have uh, to, to aid and negative duties you have not to harm, where negative duties trump positive duties, which means that if you're stuck in a conflict where you can either help five people or kill one person, um, then you should uh, not kill the one person. Um, and she thought that this would help not solve the trolley problem because she didn't talk about the trolley problem in those terms, but she thought it could solve other, other problems. Uh, and one of the weaknesses of her theory was that it was possible to construct cases very similar to her original trolley case with a driver, 
where if you think of the driver as acting either way, you're dealing with a conflict between negative duties. So you kill five or you kill one. So it's not positive versus negative. So you choose the least bad options and you switch. Uh, but it's very similar cases. It looks like Foot's solution gets the wrong answer. And so Judith Thompson, who was one of these, uh, one of the main contributors to the literature in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and noughties, uh, she came up with this wonderful example, which has now become one of the canonical parts of the trolley problem, which is the bystander case, which we've talked about before, where you have a bystander who just happens to be near the train that's hurtling down. Perhaps the, the driver has fainted or some such thing and has the choice between letting it go towards the five and turning it towards the one. And then the problem is that if the bystander does turn it towards the one, they are infringing on a negative duty against the one. Whereas intuitively, this is controversial, everything is controversial. If the bystander lets the, the, the trolley go towards the five, uh, they are merely not acting on a positive duty. And if the negative duty trumps the positive duty, uh, as Foote says, the, the bystander shouldn't switch. But overwhelming majority response is it's okay to switch. So standard philosophical tool, counterexample to the original view of, to of Foots. And so a new a search starts to, to come up with an alternative solution. And you've talked a little bit. Um, uh, does that relate to the idea of uh, the, to me, it sounds like there's a, a very uh, there's a slight distinction, but important between positive duty, negative duty. You mentioned they can switch. It's OK to switch. Um, can you talk a little bit about having to switch and what the how that fits in? So if that if that makes sense, because I think that's slightly, a, you know, when you talk about the choice between a positive and negative duty and then there's like there's like you have to do something in this case. And I think that's even a, you know, I have the cho choice to switch from five to one or I have to do that or I am immoral. Yes. So this is interesting. Uh, and. Uh... And also, of course, has been subject to great controversy. But so when 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 Thompson first introduced the bystander case, she she stopped short of saying that the the bystander should switch. Um, why that is the case is interesting. But let's say who let's be very clear about who says that they should switch. A, a simple act consequentialist who says you should always act to minimize bad or maximize good will say that you, you ought to switch. You'd be wrong not, not to do so. So one thing uh, you might have is just an intuitive feeling um, that perhaps it's asking too much for the person to switch in this case, and that's why it's not permissible to switch. It's not obligatory to switch. But there are some arguments that suggest that the, the permissibility is, is there as opposed to the obligation. One argument, which is actually um, um, articulated by one of the authors of this book, uh, Peter Graham, is that uh, if you think about the possibility uh, of being the person who is about to be killed, the work person on the track, uh, suppose that they had the opportunity to turn the trolley back on the person who was switching. Uh, would that be okay for them to do? So would it be okay to defend yourself against being sacrificed for the great good? And the thought is, uh, yes, it would be. And then <laughs> the thought is, well, if you'd be permissible for the work person to defend themselves by then killing the bystander, it can't be obligatory for the bystander to have to switch. <laughs> now, I'm not sure what I make of that argument. It's, a, it's, a, it's an argument. It's a premise in an argument. You can talk about it for a long time. But yep. it's one way of trying to at least make it intuitively plausible by introducing a further complication, which is, of course, often what happens in these cases, or to, to, to motivate the idea that it's permissible, neither obligatory or, or impermissible. Thompson, of course, uh, to make things even more complicated, eventually changed her mind and, and decided it was uh, forbidden to switch. So, just, just to make the record a little murkier, I love it. Um... I, I, I want to go back to something that you said. You talked about the whole goal of this um, and ethics in general is to live well. Um, can you, as you've studied this throughout, 
how has this helped you to live better? And uh, what do you think is the value overall of ethics to live well? What do you mean by that? Well, so, so one thing that this problem brings to light is the sense of being, as it were, lost in the weeds when it comes to explaining your, your, ethical, your ethical convictions. And so it often produces a sense of bewilderment. You know, I remember the first time I was introduced to a philosophical thought experiment like this. It wasn't the trolley problem. It was a similar problem was when I was at, at school, at the end of the class, because there had been no resolution, one of the students stood up and said, yes, but teacher, what's the answer? Felt like they had been cheated, right? Because, you know, after all, we were going to work out what to do. And that was a sense of frustration. I mean, I think some students, if, if, the, if the discussion goes a certain way where it becomes more like a game than something serious, may think that, oh, who cares? There's no answer. There's no better or worse here. You know, ethics is just a joke, right? And I think there is, a, there is a slight subversive potential to this kind of way of thinking about philosophy. I think it can be dangerous and it can be irresponsibly applied. I think that is something that needs to be brought into mind. So one of the things that's important for me, and it, so it is to answer your question, not talk about something else, uh, it, oh, it's that um, one of the things we can, we can bring to light is by thinking about these difficult cases, is what are the things that are not negotiable? So there are various things that are negotiable. But mm -hmm. there are certain kinds of ways in which whoever is making a claim within this literature is somehow keeping their moral bearings. Okay? So the simplest way of thinking about that is as follows. Does the fact that nobody has found a generally accepted solution to the problem, trolley problem, is that an argument of being skeptical about there ever being a right thing to do? Well, no. Because no one is suggesting that if you have the, the, the original trolley case with five people on one, on one track and, and one on the other, it would be much nicer if they were both on the same so you could kill them all. Right? No one is suggesting that. Right? So whether you're a consequentialist who thinks that you should always minimize the bad or maximize the good, or whether you're a, what's nowadays called a non-consequentialist who's looking for a set of principles or constraints and when you shouldn't, there are certain kinds of things that are not negotiable. Even the non-consequentialists agree, most of them, everything is controversial in philosophy, that the consequences right. matter, right? Yeah. And so we have, there are certain kinds of things. There's, a, there's like a moral, let's call it a background that is, kept, uh, that is kept fixed. And the same is true outside of the, the literature on the moral or the trolley problem where people are being confronted with examples that dumbfound them. It's usually assumed that there are certain options that are not on the table. If we reflect on that, if we add that to the conversation that, that they are not on the table, we can learn more about you know, what our fundamental moral commitments are. And if we share them, that is something. Um, and I think for me, having been being one of these people who doubt all the time, <laughs> uh, that has been quite an interesting investigation to sort of to work out uh, what are the things that are negotiable and what are the things that are not negotiable? What are the things that, what are the trends that we seem to agree about and what are the things that we tend to disagree about. I think that's great when you talk about living well. Um, there's a lot of disagreement about what living well could be, but there's actually quite a lot of agreement about what it isn't, right? Like, I mean, there's a lot of like, you know, you'll have different tracks of life with different ways of life, but they'll all look at like someone living a certain type of life and be like, yeah, that's not good. Like yeah, even the person living that life will, will, may agree. Um, I'm personally uh, just very happy, and I was hoping it would come up at, at some point. Have you seen probably the most famous internet video about the trolley problem? I've very, had it's, a very uh, quick look at it, yeah. Uh, it's the, it's the, uh, the one with the toddler, um, and the dad says, how would you solve this? And the young boy takes all of them and puts them on one side and runs over all of them. And uh, so I'm glad that you mentioned that as an example, because the reason that's funny is because everyone's like, well, yeah, that's that's wrong. Right. Like and that's like it's hilarious that a toddler would do that. And um, one, I, that video as the father of a, a seven and five year old and a five year old who has just uh, as kindly as I can say it, has a penchant for violence. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's that really that video spoke to me. But also, I think that's that is very important because. Um, I, I, a lot of what I, I want to do with this podcast is to create common ground for common action, right? For, for the common good. And, uh, 
there's so much, you know, uh, controversy that, you, you know, even, and I love that, you know, every bit of the trolley problem uh, brings in that kind of controversy. But it like, if you just broaden it to the thing, like these things, I think that's just a great point that there's, there's actually quite a bit we agree on, right? And, and I love that you, you started with that. Yeah, and there's also, I think, um, you know, there's ways of disagreeing about difficult ethical cases where the opposite side can respect what's happening uh, among the people who don't take exactly their view. Mm. So even if, there, even if there isn't convergence on what one should do in a certain moral dilemma, say, uh, there are certain kinds of uh, options that may be in some sense at least on the table, even if it's not the one that you, you prefer, and, and be able to identify what those are and to think about what the considerations are that would lead you to, to have that respect for the person who acts otherwise than you, than you do is, is itself something you can learn by thinking about these cases. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Lillehammer, this has been awesome. If you could leave our listeners with one uh, takeaway from today, what would it be? Um, well, this is, these are very challenging times. So I would say, uh, don't lose the courage of your moral convictions. Mm. That is, uh, that is, I, I love the, the very gentle rebuke, uh, embodied in that. Uh, what a great way to sum up what we have talked about today. Uh, Dr. Lillehammer, it's been an absolute uh, joy to talk to you today. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Take care.